Listen. My fortune. What do we have, Captain? We have land, Mr. Murray. everyone, the latest Unreal Fellowship workshop is a wrap, and the Fellows projects are ready to make their debut, showcasing their exploration of real-time production design and world building. From dimly lit sci-fi labs to battle-torn ruins filled with dire warnings, the variety of environments these artists created is phenomenal. If you'd like to get a heads up for applications, subscribe to our newsletter, and while you wait, watch the inspiring sizzle and get started yourself with loads of courses on the Epic Developer Community. Unreal Fest is heading down under for the first time ever. In the region, join us on the Gold Coast from June 21st to 22nd for two action-packed days of skills development, epic dev support networking, and an Unreal Fest party. Get your ticket for Unreal Fest Gold Coast today. Filmmaker Tim Richardson's short, Neon Rapture, takes Iris Van Herpen's futuristic fashion line into a stunning virtual world, blurring the line between couture and cinema. By digitizing the experience, collections take on new meanings, making even casual viewers rethink how far a piece or an idea can go. In our latest spotlight, see how they brought their collection beyond the catwalk. Now to highlight a few top tutorials from this month, take a swim with Community Hero Death Ray CG's Ocean Simulation Tutorial, which is a step-by-step -step guide creating a beautiful ocean system entirely with Niagara. When you're ready to step back inside, see the USD demonstrates the process of creating a floor plan in UE using path tracing. It's easy to set up and the result looks lovely. Plans like these can be a very useful addition for ArcVis projects. Authorized Unreal Engine instructor Gabriel Paiva takes on the commonly misunderstood camera look-at-tracking attribute and will help you leverage its uses like a pro. 
dig into these tutorials and more in the Epic Developer Community. Bouncing to this week's Community Spotlights, prepare for hordes of angry buttons in Scotland-based Reality Adrift Studios Button Pop. Defend yourself with a variety of turrets and generators, collecting riches along the way. Wishlist Button Pop on Steep. Looking for a retreat in the woods? CG artist Elia Luongo built a home inspired by Robert Hutchison architecture, featuring various lighting scenarios created in UE5. Check out Lights in the Forest and more of their incredible work on their ArtStation page. And we'll leave you with this gorgeous demo reel from animation director and artist Ali Reza Fatahi. Battle against raging monsters, race through fantastical, futuristic cities, and beyond in their exciting showcase. Watch now and show them your support in the community. Thanks for watching this week's news and community spotlight. Um, hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore, and celebrate everything Unreal. I am your host, Tina, and today with me, I have two incredible guests who are going to be going over the material UI labs that we have um, set up today. The link for it is currently pinned in the chat. So if you haven't yet, go ahead and take a second to go grab that project. It is free, and you can go ahead and follow along with what we're going to be going through today. But before we dive in, I do want to quickly introduce our guest for today. So first up, we have um, Irene. Would you like to tell us just a little bit about yourself? Hey, hi, Tina. Thank you for having me. Um, yes, I'm Irene Zanon. I am a senior technical UI designer on Fortnite at Epic Games. Um, I have been a technical UI artist and a technical artist in the past. I've worked, uh, um, before Epic, I worked at Ubisoft, uh, and before that, I worked um, at an indie studio in my home country, which is Italy. And I'm really excited to be here and really excited to talk to you about the Material Lab. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Very excited to have you and dig into what you've brought in here today. And then second up, but certainly not last or least, we have Pavlo. Would you like would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself as well? Good day, everybody. Uh, my name is Pavlo Grubi. I'm a technical UI design director on Fortnite at Epic Games. Been here for almost two years. Uh, originally, I'm from Ukraine and I have been in the industry for over 12 years. And here I am trying to deliver the best tools and practices I can uh, together with the awesome teams of the Fortnite and, and the Unreal Engine uh, to deliver the best tools and practices to make sure that we have our production top notch and to the highest standards. That's me. Awesome. Well, thank you also for being here. I'm very excited to get into the project today. Um, UI, I know I was talking a little bit earlier before the stream even started about this, but UI is definitely a topic that I feel like we don't get to touch on enough, honestly. I don't know if it, there will ever be enough <laughs> because it is such a vast topic with so much available to be done in it. So really appreciate you being here and also providing this incredible project for anyone who might be interested in getting started in it and wasn't sure where to go. And now they just have this beautiful present that you have made and packaged and tied with a nice cute little bow just for them. So thank you so much for being here. Very excited, very excited. We worked hard on these and we are really happy that finally people can allow the project. And as UI people, as you said, there's not a lot of UI educational material there. Many of us are self-taught, especially when it comes to material. Um, and so we just wish to bring something that can help people start it, especially if they come from different backgrounds for more like uh, different types of software like Photoshop or Figma or Illustrator and so on. Um, so Pablo is, is with me uh, today because I needed some support and he will also be um, helping me with uh, um, the Q&A. Uh, but I have a presentation for you and then I will have also a demo so I can uh, um, show you in the engine how 
you can use the UI Material Lab. Um, I can share my screen now. Um, so we did introductions already. I feel like I also need to introduce my cat, Oxo, just because you probably will see him a lot <laughs> in the in the um, project and also probably during the presentation. Um, so I mentioned having um, worked uh, um, at different studios. Uh, so as a senior technical UI designer, I work with materials quite a lot. Um, if I am mainly self-taught, uh, like, like I assume most of us are. Um, and my background before game development was graphic design. So I was used to certain type of software that works in a certain way that is not necessarily how UI material uh, work. Um, and that's one of the reasons behind the material lab. Um, so I noticed some stuff while uh, working with materials. First thing, not going to lie, materials are intimidating. Um, they introduce new concepts that we, not, we might not necessarily be used to, like the concept of UVs. Um, they rely heavily on math. And many nodes' names are just not self-explanatory. Like, uh, now I know that LERP stands for linear interpolation, but if someone just just wrote LERP somewhere, I just didn't you know. I I wouldn't know what they meant. And and I, I like I always wondered, <laughs> does saturate have anything to do with saturation? Well, the answer is uh, no. Um, also, if you come from certain types of software, you are used to expressing your values in pixels, and you can't really do that in UI materials. Most of the values that you will be using are zero to one values. So it just works differently. Um, so yes, I do use materials a lot, but most of the time I'm just reusing the same nodes over and over. Um, I find myself having to loop time, so I will take uh, the game time and I will multiply it by a speed parameter and then I use the frac node. Or I have to do some basic transforms like translating, rotating, scaling. Uh, I need some gradients like linear gradients or radial gradients. Uh, but it's always the same combinations of nodes. And despite reusing these things very often, I still don't always get it right the first time. Math is hard, and this is a fact, <laughs> uh, especially when you try to translate math into something visual. It's not like an immediate translation. And you have to keep in mind the sequence of operations and even like the order of inputs in some, uh, in some cases. Um, so for this stream, I want to assume that people who are watching this are already familiar with the very basics of material, so it will not be teaching you how to create a material or how to create a material instance, although you will see me do that. So if that's if, if you don't know how to do that, just you, you will just see how it is done. Um, but I would still like to cover just a couple of concepts that I feel are important to explain so that we're all on the same page and pertain particularly UI materials so that we all know we're all on the same page. So we know that materials are basically sets of instructions. Um, and these instructions determine the appearance of the pixel, of each pixel of the object we want to render. So what do we want to render? Like if you're not used with UI material, you might think that you're rendering a mesh because that's what most materials are doing. They are rendering pixels on a mesh. Um, but in the case of, mat of UI materials, we are rendering uh, widgets, so we are rendering images, borders, text. Uh, um, they are just different types of objects. Um, what makes a material a UI material is that we use the user interface material domain, which is what you can set when you create or when you have a material open. And what this does, it, it changes the output of the material um, to three or four um, values that we can set, and these values determine what the pixel looks like. So the values that we can set are the color of the pixel, so it's an RGB value, and the opacity of the pixel, depending on the blend mode, like if it's not opaque, you can decide the opacity. And this is the alpha, and it's a zero to one value. Um, and we can also control the screen position, although we will not cover this during the, this live stream. And yeah, as I mentioned, we use zero to one values for 
almost all of them except for the screen position. Um, so things to keep in mind. Each pixel doesn't know anything about the other pixels because pixels are all rendered at the same time, pretty much, all of them. Um, so they don't know about each other. And each pixel doesn't know what it looked like in the, in the previous frame. We don't store information between frames with UI materials. So what does the pixel know? And how does the pixel know what it has to look like? Um, the most, a bunch of things. The most important stuff is the position of this pixel relative to its container. And it's what we call the UV coordinates. So UV coordinates is a couple of values. The first value is the horizontal position of the pixel. So all the way to the left will be zero and all the way to the right will be one and all the values in between. And the second value is the vertical position. So all the way to the top, it will be zero and all the way to the bottom, it, it will be one. Um, this uh, position, could be relative to the container, as you said, but also it could be relative to something else. For example, relative to the screen. It, these are called like different types of coordinate spaces. A material function that is in the engine and that we use in Fortnite all the time, but I, I feel like it's a bit obscure. Like I, I don't find much information out there about this, but it's really vital for UI materials is to get user interface UV. This not only outputs different sets of coordinate um, of UV coordinates, but also the pixel size, which is the size in pixels of the container. And this is important because you might, uh, as we said, we have zero to one values. So where uh, zero and one are the limits of the container where we draw something. This means that if you stretch a container and you don't account for that, the content will be stretched. But if you know how big the container is, you can compensate the stretch. And that's what the pixel size node is useful for. And also another uh, information that the pixel has is the game time. And this is very useful for animation. Um, we use animations inside materials a lot in Fortnite because it's just more performant for us to animate more in materials rather than in sequencer because it relies more on the GPU rather than the CPU. Um, concept that I think everyone is familiar with, but Still better, uh, better to make it clear because it is the foundation of the Material Lab. It's the concept of material functions. As I mentioned, if you find yourself repeating the same operations over and over, it might be worth just packing them into material function, um, which becomes an asset that you can reuse in different materials. So you don't have to redo the same operation. You just drag a material function, and it does the, the thing for you. It contains the logic. It has inputs and outputs. And if you are uh, more familiar with After Effects, I think it is a similar concept to the concept of effects in After Effects. It's not the exact same thing, but the concept is similar, um, where there's some a bunch of operations that happen under the hood. And what we see and what we can control is a bunch of input parameters, which are the same as the inputs in our material functions. And basically, the, um, these parameters just change the output of our of um, of our material function and one difference is probably that we can have different outputs with unreal so for example we can have if we have a function that draws a circle we can have an output that draws the disk so the field circle and the different outputs that maybe draws only the outline but for the rest they work in a similar way and of course, it wouldn't be UI if we didn't mention UMG, um, because UMG is the UI editor that we use in Unreal. Um, materials integrate perfectly into UMG because all the parameters that we create in our materials uh, can be animated. They can be animated into the animation sequencer, um, but they can also be set directly in the blueprint. Um, and just a, a quick side note, something that we try to do in Fortnite is to animate less parameters in Sequencer for the reasons that I said before, because we want to move our calculations from the CPU to the GPU. And so for simple transitions, like you have a button that has maybe a hovered and unhovered state, what you would do is you would have a control that is the hovered, which is just a, a float that goes from zero to one. And that's the one that you animate in the sequencer, so you animate just one parameter in the sequencer, 
And inside the material, you have parameters depending on this control. So for example, in this GIF, we have a color for the button when it's hovered and the color for the button default. And we animate the hovered control. And what happens inside the material is that it picks one or the other depending on if the button is hovered or not. Um, so yeah, this is something that can help with performance of the game and also can help review the states because you can preview the hover state directly from the material instance. So time to talk about the material lab because we haven't even mentioned it yet. Uh, so the material lab is a collection of material functions, uh, not only material functions, but also techniques or something that we call techniques, which is either combinations of, of material functions or best practices like uh, the use of SDFs, which we will talk about uh, later on. The philosophy behind it is that these are intuitive to use, especially for artists. And we will see later how we try to make this happen. Uh, but the idea is that they can be very easily chainable and can be used like building blocks. So you can chain a translate, a rotate, and then a box, and then you can slant it, and then you can turn it into a half tone. I don't know. What the Material Lab is not, is it's not an explanation of the super basic stuff, as I mentioned. So it will not be explaining to you what a step is, but also it will not, it is also not the extreme opposite. It's not this complex material breakdown. It's in the middle. Uh, and the material functions that you will find in a project are tend to be quite generic, uh, not super specific, because we just don't feel that there's much use for material functions that you probably would use just once in your life or never. So um, nothing too specific. This is an overview of the material functions that we have in the lab. So when you open the project, you will see that they are in, in the form of, of uh, cards. And these cards are all different examples. Um, and we have different, we sorted them into different categories. And the last tab, which is the applications tab, has a collection of widgets. So you not only you will be able to check out how the materials are made, but also you can use them in UMG in real cases. So like to make a button or to make a inventory slot or a progress bar or whatever. So you can really check out how uh, maybe parameters can be animated and how you can um, trigger an animation from, for a button that maybe gets hovered or, or stuff like that. Um, so, I, the main purpose of the, of the material lab is education, educational. Um, these materials that we have uh, in our examples are heavily commented so that if you really want to understand what's going on, you just open the material or the material function and you just uh, read all the comments and follow through um, and hopefully it is easy, easily understandable. Um, but also at the same time, for people who are starting, and not only, uh, we want to also convey some best practices that they can use. And we will see later when we talk about SDFs in particular, how you can really boost the performance of your, of your game by using less textures and also the visual quality of it, and you can get better animations. Uh, there's just lots of advantages. Uh, but also, if you are already working with materials, you might just want to expand your material library. And that's also, we hope, a useful tool for that because um, there are a lot of material functions. Uh, maybe you just want to check out if there's a different way of doing something that you're already doing. And why not? Inspiration, because maybe you just started with Unreal Engine, you don't even know what you can do um, with UI, and maybe you don't even know you can do certain animations inside materials and stuff. Um, so we hope this can provide some inspiration. And maybe you are a designer or an artist and you just want to prototype something. Um, this is really a safe space to do that. It's called Material Lab for a reason because it really is meant to be experimented with and to be just played with, you know? So, I just want to give you a little tease of how these cards that we saw before would translate into material functions in a practical application. This is not the demo. I will just do a demo just in a little bit. 
Um, so I will not really explain exactly what's going on, but just give you an idea of how you would go, for example, creating this objective marker. So you could maybe use this for a capture point or something. It has this diamond that and has a progress bar that fills. So the way you would go with that is if you didn't even know where to start, you would probably just uh, check all the material functions that we have in the examples and just try to find something that is good for you. So first I would think, yeah, I would just take a box and I will rotate it 45 degrees and I will take the outline of the box and then I will use some sort of mask to mask the progress the, the way I want it. And that's how we go with, uh, uh, with it. So the box, we have a material function, it's the STF box. And as you can see, you have a bunch of input parameters and we take the outline output. And this is what it looks like, just an outline, box outline. So now we want to rotate it 45 degrees and also to scale it to fill the container. So this is the custom rotator that is in the engine. And this is our scale function. So see, we are chaining them together. Um, and this is what we see now. Now we basically want to be able to find some gradient that we can use to mask the progress. And this is what the square gradient is for. It is a gradient that goes from zero to one along a square. Uh, now I'm just here storing the UVs so that I can use them, so that I can give the rotated UVs to the square gradient and this is what it looks like and I combine it with a step so that it becomes like a harsh mask zero or one and I'm using linear time in this case to animate it but of course this could be set by a parameter maybe that you set in blueprint uh, so this is our progress mask so now we want to take the outline that we had um, and we want to intersect it with the mask so the mask will mask the outline and we use the min node for that. So it, uh, this is the outline that we were using before. This is the progress mask that we made. And this is the output. It's a masked outline. And now we just make another box for the thinner background line. And really nothing fancy about that. It's the same box, just with slightly different parameters. Uh, the stroke is thinner and it's just a bit smaller. And this is our progress background. And we just uh, combine the alpha with what we had before so that we see both of them and now we need just one thing which is the inner diamond fill which is again another box and this time instead of using the outline we use the fill so it's filled and it's a bit smaller and we just combine this so basically now we use the three boxes a rotator and a scale and we have all the alphas that we need to also use them with the colors and now it becomes lerp frenzy because we have we use the the masks that we have created so we have our diamond and we say okay where there's the diamond make it this greenish color when there's the progress make it this light blue color and for the rest use this gray color and so here we have it it's uh, just an animated capture objective marker this is the final material and you will notice that we used no textures and this matters because we are saving memory, which we can use for other textures, maybe textures that are cooler and that we really need. Uh, we don't need to worry about the texture resolution. And it's just easier to animate because animating a parameter is just, is just easier than trying to animate a texture. <laughs> um, and all these values that we can tweak really give us a quicker iteration time because we can just tweak a parameter. We don't need to re-export the texture and then re-import it in the engine and then see the stuff update. We can just change literally a number and we see what is changing. So I hope I teased you a little <laughs> with, with, uh, with how it works. Uh, now I really invite you, if you haven't done it already, to download the project. It is free in the marketplace and it comes with a tutorial. The tutorial is in three parts. The first part is an introduction. It explains to you basically what I explained to you just now, how to get the project and how to use it. And then second part is a huge documentation with all the material functions. So it explains inputs and outputs of all of them. It shows you what it looks like and it also gives you additional examples and explanations. 
And the third part is uh, just a list of interesting combinations, so ways you can combine these material functions in ways that maybe you didn't even think about. Um, and this is supposed to be some sort of living document that we will, where we will add stuff uh, as soon as we think about new stuff. So let's just uh, open the engine. And so if you download the project, pretty much this is what you should see. You have your UI Material Lab folder, and you have a bunch of other folders. First thing I really suggest you do is just press play. If you press play, you will have uh, a bunch of cards. We sorted them into categories. And I will not go through all of them. I will not explain all of them. We have a documentation for them for that. And some of them, I mean, the examples are there for this. I will probably just explain some concepts behind some of them. So we have our transforms here. We have our gradients um, and all these gradients, they actually work. They can be plugged, they can be remapped with this remappable gradient function that works very much like Photoshop or Illustrator. Whenever you, you edit a gradient, you can just move the values around to make the gradient the way you like it. And this is how this function works. Um, and then we have time. Um, so I'm just gonna show you something about time. I'm going to make a new material and I'm going to use the user interface domain. So I want to just animate something. So let's uh, draw a circle. I will use my STF circle function with the fill. And this is what it looks like. Maybe smaller would be better. OK, and now I want to show you time. This is our material function, linear time. As you can see, it has three outputs. So I just want to animate this circle from this corner to the top right corner. So I use translate. And um, by the way, an another way of seeing all the material functions is you can just right click or tab when you are in the material editor, and you find the UI material lab category. And you have all your functions here. And as you can see, they all have a naming convention where they start with mf underscore ui underscore the name of the function. And also, quick disclaimer, some of these functions um, are referring to functions that we already have in engine, like the rotate is the custom rotator that is already in, in the engine. It hasn't been created in the UI material lab. I just felt it was it made sense to include it because it's it's a tool that you can already use, but at least now you have a method, a method on how you would chain these things. And it, it makes sense that we would include some of them. Um, so I wanted to translate my stuff. So from a UV output to a UV input, and this is how we chain everything. Basically, we always have a UV input and output everywhere, and that's how we can uh, just chain everything together. So I give it a starting point, um, which will be, actually, I don't need a vector 2. Vector 1 will be enough. So this, OK, I just moved it down here. And I will turn it into 0, 5 if I have to move it up here. So what I do is I lerp between these two values that I found, the 0, 5 and the minus 0, 5. And I will use the linear time as my value that will animate and so we'll go from minus 0, 05 to 0, 05 and so my first output is, is the 0, 01 loop so as you can see it goes from 0 to 1 back to 0 to 1 and it keeps looping also i can increase increase the speed maybe 0, 05 is better and then we have ping pong which goes from 0 to 1 and back to 0 in the same time. And then we have switch, which just uh, goes is either 0 or 1. So this is our linear time. And it's not over because we can, this time is linear, but we can change the speed curve of, of our animation by using our easing functions. So we have a material function called uh, ease curves. And basically, there are a bunch of easing functions out there. 
we included sine, cubic, and quintic, but there are more that you can find and that we will probably add in the future. But the way it works is that you can easily combine linear time with our ease curves. You just take your value, my loop here. So this is what the normal uh, linear time looks like. And let's make it slow at the beginning. So this just changes the character of the animation. And it has different um, types of curves. So is in, is out, and is in out. And we will also see later how this is not just for time, but you can use this also for other things, like for gradients, to change the hardness of the gradient. And then probably my favorite effect is the time displays. I say my favorite because it is really simple in concept, but so versatile. So the idea behind the time displays is that you have an animation, some value that is animating. But you just want to give a delay to part of this animation. So let's just look at this blue box that is animating from top to bottom. Um, we want to com combine this with a delay mask. So we will use, uh, in this case, it's a horizontal linear gradient. And what the delay mask does is uh, you set a value that you're animating. In this case, the vertical transla translation. You set an offset, which I don't know, could be 0, 05. And then you put a mask. And where the mask is black, so it is 0, there will be no delay. And where the mask is white, there will be the delay that you set and all the values in between. So if you apply this delay mask to this animation, what you get is like this kind of like slanted animation because the more you go to the right, the more delayed the animation is. Maybe more interesting it is with the stepped gradient in the second example, because then you can really see the different chunks animating at different delays. And the mask can be anything really. In this case, for example, we have a box that is rotating and we combine it with the time displays and the delay mask and the, the um, radial gradient. So in the center, black, which means zero, which means no delay. And the more outwards we go, the brighter the mask is, so the more delay we have, which means that these corners of the box will just be delayed compared to the rest. And we get this kind of like, shuriken galaxy spiral sort of thing which is also pretty much this example this fifth example that we have here just a bit embellished and if we go on we find the sdfs so sdfs are just are just the best thing in the world because because you will see right now so SDF stands for sign the distance field. So when you have to draw a shape, you're used to, to using a texture. So you would have this texture with, I don't know, a white triangle on a black background. Um, but you could replace this texture entirely with a primitive, so like circle, triangle, um, box that is calculated with math. Um, and so, there are some differences, of course. Instead of having a mask, like a, a white on black, for example, you would have a gradient as an output. And this gradient, in this gradient, each pixel is expressed as the distance of this pixel to the closest point of the shape we want to draw. I will explain better. <laughs> so um, let's take, for example, this circle here. So the circle I want to draw is a circle of size. 0, 0.5. It is this magenta circle here. So what I what this SDF outputs is 0 for each point that is on the circle because the distance of that point from the circle is 0. It is on the circle. And the further we go from the circle, the higher the distance becomes, so the higher the value, which means the brighter. Um, and these are called signed because when the point is inside of the shape, it has a negative distance, so it has a sign. Um, of course, you don't really need to know the math that is going on here because you have a material function that does it for you. And the material function already has 
the smooth step applied to it so it does output in the normal fill and outline outputs it outputs your white shape on a black background but why is this relevant is because we are not using a texture so as i mentioned before the memory is happy but also because of their nature sdfs come with really some interesting properties if you see this uh, this um, square at the bottom the further we go from the shape we want to draw the rounder the corners become so you can easily get rounded corners you don't even have to worry about the shape getting bigger because we compensated that already in the material function so you just have the same shape but we rounded corners and since this is a gradient you can uh, you can use this to make a, a glow or a shadow anything that needs um, we can control the level of blurriness of the shape and then there's another super cool thing which is the wave effect so let's look at this highlighted part in the in the magenta square and as we said this is a gradient because it's a distance and let's say it's a zero to one range which probably it isn't it's probably from zero to zero five but for simplicity let's say it's from zero to one we can do some math with this we can multiply this by a number let's say four in this case uh, so now we have a zero to four range and we can apply more math to it for example if we do a frac what we're doing is we're splitting this into four different chunks that go from zero to one and imagine doing this for the entire um, container so for every pixel what do you get in the end is these like concentric frames that you can also animate and they look very cool and if you don't want to use frac you can use many other uh, operations to give the shape different looks and if you want to see it in action it is this function here um, and we will also see it in action in the demo so i mentioned the glow i mentioned the shadow uh, each stf has the stroke output and can have rounded corners uh, also something cool if you're already used to working with shapes in uh, uh, illustrator or wherever uh, of course you know that you can combine intersect and subtract uh, shapes and you can of course do this with sdfs as well but with an added perk which is with some math magic you can uh, have a smooth blending of these shapes as you can see in the second row here of the boolean operations and so it gives it this like liquidy feeling you can also control how much it it smooths the blending uh, so I don't know if you're if uh, your next project is a lava lamp material, you can probably use this. Um, mm -mm -mm. And this is just an overview of the SDFs that we that we made. I mean that we added to the material lab. So we have the box, we have triangle, circle, and hexagon, and we will probably add more in the future. Uh, and you can really see how just by changing the parameters that we have um, we can have so many different versions of this and we can have many different usages for them and how easy it is to animate from one to the other so you see so you have a button that has straight corners and when it's uh, selected you want it to turn into rounded corners that's very easily done by just changing one parameter and in the last row you can see how you can uh, do a union, a subtraction, and an intersection, and how it changes when you make it smooth compared to when it's uh, not smooth. So I think that's really cool. But going on, ah, one thing actually is I did mention SDFs as a replacement for textures, but actually you can also make distance field textures. You have to create them, you have to make them yourself. And in the documentation, in the SDF section, I also link an article that explains to you how to make them in Photoshop. There are also plugins that can do that. But basically, in this case, it's not signed because it's a texture, so you can't have a negative value on a texture. But they do share many of the same properties. So this is what a distance field texture might look like. And like we do with the signed distance fields, you can use a smooth step and just control the glow min and glow max to change the sharpness of the of the shape 
and it can share the same uh, same properties like uh, uh, an out drawing an outline or having it uh, making a glow or a cool blending or even morphing between them. Um, so it's not necessarily that you have to replace all the textures with distance fields. You can also have distance field textures and they have the added bonus that you can make them smaller because of, it's because of the way you can sharpen them, you can actually get them a lot bigger than the texture actually is. So that's very interesting. Uh, then we have uh, the mask section. Um, I mean, masks, I really just invite you to just try them out. Um, they have so many different usages. Uh, radius segments is very useful in combination with the circle outline because you can get this like segmented progress bar. And checkers I, is very useful if you combine it, for example, with grid tiling, because then you can like alternate what you show on the different cells of a grid, uh, which we can see here. I don't know if it's very visible in the stream, but we're basically tiling in a, in a grid um hearts and diamonds and we're alternating when we are showing hearts and diamonds so in this case we combine the grid tiling with the checkers to to determine what to show and speaking of tiling we also have hexagonal tiling which also outputs hexagonal pattern and then we have also different types of patterns halftone is basically a grid tiling where in each cell there is a dot you could actually put anything in there. You could put squares. You can even put little OXO faces. You could definitely do that. Um, and it works with any input gradient. So if you see like third example, the one with the OXO picture, um, where the gradient is darker, your dot is smaller. And when the gradient is brighter, your dot is bigger. So it's, um, it's a very um, easy way to stylize something with a half tone uh, look. And then we have a tab for distortions. Um, slant, skew, wave warp is very cool because you can just distort the UVs with a sine wave. And then we have polar coordinates. So polar coordinates are interesting <laughs> because we are used to expressing uh, the position of a point with Cartesian coordinates. So like the point has two values, and these values are the distances from the two axes that we decide, so the y-axis and the x-axis. axis. But that's not the only um, coordinate system that we can have. We can have radial coordinates. And what the polar coordinates function does is it translates from one space from the Cartesian to the polar. Um, so what visually it looks like is it's like you were wrapping your uh, your polar coordinates uh, sorry your square coordinates onto a globe and just looking at them from the top um something really interesting about this is whenever you have a horizontal or a vertical translation they become something different in polar coordinates um, so you can see for example the green line here vertical translation becomes an expansion around the pole. And the red line, which is the horizontal translation, when it is in polar coordinates, it becomes a rotation around the pole. Uh, so that's how like, we made super quickly this radar. It's just a grid with two lines that are moving. And then you put it in polar coordinates, it becomes some sort of radar. So that's also cool. And then we have a tab that is utilities, which are functions that on their own, maybe they don't do a lot, but you probably will use them a lot in combination with others, of which my favorite is ping pong. So ping pong takes a um, gradient that goes from zero to one, and it makes it go from zero to one and back to zero as many times as you want. So it's very useful for repeating gradients and for every everything that you want to repeat, actually. And finally, the applications tab, which is where we have all our widgets. So if you, for example, if you're looking for a base widget, um, I don't know, you want to check out this. There's a lot of, of examples. These are some inventory slots that can have like an active state and they also have a hover state and you can active. Uh, I don't know, maybe you want to, I don't know, equip <laughs> an ax and a shield or something. Um, and like these are the objective markers that we uh, saw in the example. 
progress bars that use SDFs, small um, stat indicators that also have these like tiny bubbles that go up. I mean, there's lots of examples and I invite you to just take a look and to see if something inspires you. And I think we are done with the, um, the work through and yes, it is demo time. So now I would like to show you something. Um, I have thought about like, what am I gonna show? And in the end, I came up with this idea. Maybe I can show you a button because we have buttons everywhere in UI. And maybe we just want some cool animation and we want, it, uh, and we want to use uh, lots of material lab functions. So this is our button. Um, as you can see, it's like a box, but it is slanted and it has these kind of lines that move from, uh, from the edges outwards. And then it also has, I don't know how visible it is on the stream, but it has uh, like a sheen that uh, moves uh, horizontally. Um, and so, yes, that's what we want to start with. So the way we would go with that is, let's check out what we have. So we said we want a box. So let's use the SDF box. Um, and we have a function for slanting them. So for slanting UV, so we can apply it to our box. And I think we can use the wave for the lines. Yes, I think we can start with this. So this is the material that I um, created before. So let's start with the box. So SDF box, and this is a box. I want the preview to look more like a button. So I'm gonna just change the size of it. So this is our button. Um, so size of the button. Let's make some parameters for that. So button size x. So when I don't have many parameters, I like splitting the x and y sizes just because it's more handy. But when there's lots of parameters, maybe you want to group them into just one vector parameter. Um, so maybe 0, 0.7 and 0, 0.7 for the moment. And you turn them into a vector too by using the append vector node. Okay, so this is more like the size we want. Um, now we want uh, probably something that I do a lot is I like to use uh, reroute nodes uh, because I like to keep everything tidy in chunks. So I'm gonna call this button shape. And this is what it looks like. And I'm gonna plug this. I want this material to be translucent because we will need the alpha. And for the moment, I will just do opacity and I will just assume that the whole button is white and we think of the colors later on. So this is our button shape. Now we want to slant it. And let's just uh, use uh, the slant material function from UV output to UV input. And it's maybe too slanted, so we want to give it a different amount to slant. Um, so we can slant horizontally or vertically or both. So we need to slant uh, just horizontally. So we're gonna make a vector two where the vertical slant is zero. We don't want vertical slant. And the horizontal slant is another parameter which we will call slant amount. And I think zero one would be a good, maybe zero 15, yeah. So this is our slanted bottom. Already we are somewhere. Now we could make uh, the these like waves here. So let's check out the wave material function. As you can see, it needs an SDF as input. So I can't just plug the fill there. I will need to use the SDF. So again, I like storing this somewhere. I'm gonna call this button. STF. This is what the STF looks like. So it's a gradient and the inner part here, it looks black, but it's not zero. It's a negative value. Uh, so this, I mean, shouldn't bother you if you use the normal fill and outline output, but if you have to manipulate the STF, 
you need to remember that the range can go from minus one to one. So this is our button SDF. I am gonna input it to the wave. And let's see all the different outputs that the wave has. This is if we use the cosine as an output. This is if we use the ping pong. And this is if we use the frac. I think I will go with the ping pong. And of course, I want to sharpen it because now it's just a gradient. So I will use smooth step. And let's try and see what values we need to input them. Uh, let's uh, try 0, 1. And with, whenever you use smooth step, the hardness of the smoothing is always depending on how close the min and max values are. So first, actually, I want to try, I want to find out what that value is. So let's say I start with 0, 4, and maybe 0, 5. Yeah, I think this is a nice um, smoothness of the lines. So I know that there has to be 0 0.1 of difference between the first and the second. So now I can do this more automatically. So I will input this and then I will use the same, but with plus 0 1 for the max. So that now I can really just find the value that I, that I want. So 0 1, well, let's use 0 4 for the moment. So I found the wave, and I want to combine the alpha, so I will use the max node. OK, it's already looking like something. But I don't want this wave at the top and bottom, so I think I need to mask it out. There are different ways I can go with that. I think. Just out of simplicity, I will just draw another box. And this box will be the same height of my first button shape, but will just take the whole width. So I will just uh, duplicate this box. And I will take this value. So I will need a reroute for this. I don't know if you noticed, I hate having spaghetti, so I use reroutes everywhere. Um, so we'll call this button size Y. And I will use it here and the size x i could go like with a super safe 1.5 one should also be fine but okay so this will be the mask and everything that is black will be cut from the shape of the bottom so i will call this vertical bounds And I will use this in a min because we want to just keep the thing in between. So what happens when we combine this stuff with the min is that we just we just cut the top and bottom. So already looks much better. So one thing that we want to do now is if we look at this, the the lines they start thick but they become thinner over time or like the more they get far from the from the bottom 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 shape so that's what i want to do now uh, so basically what i need is this value that i found the value of the smooth step i don't want it to be a constant value i want this value to change depending on the distance from the bottom shape so what is the distance of the bottom shape? It is our SDF. It's already giving us a gradient. So we can use this as a base. So as I mentioned before, SDF has negative values. So if I have to use it in a lerp, I need to first clamp it between 0 and 1 to not have unexpected results. And that's what the saturate node does. It just makes sure that whatever I input will be clamped between 0 and 1. Uh, so I will use this 
to lerp between two values. These two values will be what how thick the line is at the start and how thick the line is at the end. So at the start, I think we could go yeah, with a 0, 1 value. So we can start with 0, 1. And at the end, um, well, let's do 0, 9 for the moment. Let's see what this looks like if we plug it. I think it's not bad. Maybe 0, 9 is too much. Yeah, 0, 8. And I should probably make some parameters for this. The scalar parameter, I will call this uh, wave mean size and wave max size. And we said it's uh, 08. OK. Let's just tidy up a little. Um, so let's group this and we call this bottom shape. We call this wave. And we call this uh, uh, cut, top, and bottom. So what's next? Um, I think we need to fade the bottom um, at, the, at the extremities. So what we could use for that is we can use a linear gradient that goes from 0 to 1 and back to 0. So ping pong. Um, so let's use linear gradient. This is a linear gradient, and let's use ping pong. And this is what it does. So instead of going from 0 to 1, it goes from 0 to 1 and back to 0. Uh, let's call this uh, horizontal fade, because that's what it is. And so we can use this here to fade the alpha, so with another mean, because we want this to be um to be intersected to the alpha so it it works correctly but there are two issues first that the gradient is not really the gradient that we want like it it is just too bright in the middle and fades too quickly and second we might want this gradient to be slanted together with the with the UVs. So I'm going to recycle these slanted UVs that I'm using here. I'm going to call these slanted UVs. And I'm going to use these UVs for our gradient as well. So first problem solved, our gradient is slanted. And now I want to change, so to kind of change the range of the gradient. So something we could do is we could just brighten up all the values so that the white takes up more space. And to do that, we can use a multiply. Um, but of course, if we multiply, we make them go out of range. So we also saturate, to keep it in the 0 to 1 range. So already, not bad. I kind of feel like the shape of the gradient could be different, could be a bit better. And that's how I would use the ease curves. I promise you that there were other ways rather, other than animations to use ease curves. Um, and I was serious. So let's try out, for example, if I use this and ease out. See, I changed the hardness of the gradient according to the curve. And actually, it looks a lot better. Actually, I might not even want to slant it. Yeah, I think it looks better not slanted. So 
this is done. I'm going to call this horizontal fade. Uh, what is left to do? Yes, we have these two like glowy lines at the top and the bottom. So again, different ways we, we could go to make this. And again, I will go out of simplicity. I will just draw another box and just take the outline. And I could use this um, low lines. I could use this outline here that I use for the vertical bounds. But the problem is that in order to make it glow, I need to change the glow mean and glow max values. So I'm going to show you. Um, for example, to make a shape more blurry, I can just increase the glow max, which is zero by default. So by default, it's completely sharp. And if I just change this value to a higher value, it gets more blurred. Problem is, if I do this, also the vertical bounds are going to be affected. So just for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to just make another box. I'm going to make another box here. And it will also it will be the same, like it will have the size of the bottom. And then it will just take the whole space. Now I can I can control glomine and max without affecting the other one. Uh, what did I call this? I call this glow lines. And let's just find the right parameters for it. I'm going to show the border. Uh, so uh, we also want to control the thickness of the stroke. So let's start with the stroke thickness. Uh, 005, uh, 002, 002. Uh, and the glow max could be 001, 01 maybe. And maybe I could change these. These are all values that then you tweak and you uh, maybe make a material instance and you just um, um, change the parameters real quick and you find out the ones that are working best. Uh, 005. Okay, not bad. Let's turn this everything in, everything into parameters. So we'll call this glow lines, glow min, and I will call this glow lines, glow max, and I will call this glow lines thickness. And these glow lines need to be faded as well. Can I use the same horizontal fade for it? Let's see. So if I do a min with the fade, yes or no? Uh, maybe just a linear one. Yes, better. So I'm going to call this linear and Linear fade. We're still recycling, just not exactly the horizontal fade, but we're not adding a new function. Okay, so we have this. And so these glow lines, whenever I do a glow, instead of using a max node, I like using an add, just because it gives like a different effect that has more to do with adding light and stuff. So uh, it was glow lines, but also whenever you add stuff and there's the risk that you go out of range, always a saturate afterwards. Okay, maybe we can boost the opacity of the lines yeah, just by multiplying by a value. I don't know if you can see this, but I can see that it gets, um, boosted a little and maybe we can play around those values when we have the material instance so this is also done and i think we've done everything in terms of masks and now we can go to colors which are just the easiest part because this was just fine they depend all on the masks i will call these glow lines now we have all the masks that we need so let's start with the base color for our button 
vector parameter and we will call this base color and I feel I have to say I'm, I'm not a good artist so the things I do they are very functional but I'm sure that artists with these tools can do a lot better things um, anyway base color so this is where we start with uh, of course we don't want any everything this color we want to since again we're doing with we're dealing with glow we want to add stuff in additive so what we want to add is the glow lines on top and maybe not just uh, with a saturate always maybe not just uh, the glow the glow lines like that we want to multiply them by a color so that we can just have a color in additive and we can call this color uh, glow lines color which is already better then of course we need to find the right colors and yes the sheen that we were talking about before so first we have to make the sheen so let's make the sheen um so this sheen is just a mirrored gradient that translates that pans horizontally so that will be easy because we already learned how to do that linear linear gradient with you guessed it ping pong and we do want to slant this one because it kind of needs to follow the slant of the bottom so we have our slanted uvs stored in our reroute and we just do like that and we want to pan it so you can use a panel but i'm going to be faithful to the material lab i'm going to use the translate function of the material lab so what do we want to translate we want to translate horizontally so uh, let's make a vector to where vertically we're not changing anything and horizontally we are animating using linear time and loop will be fine how does this look it seems okay so we'll call this chin stop previewing this guy tidy up chin and now just like i did with the glow lines i'm gonna add it in additive because it's a sheen so it's light so it's added and as i said before saturate after adding so let's make a new color for the sheen sheen color and multiply and let's take the sheen alpha that we just made so this is what it looks like we add we saturate and then we do this um, maybe let's make it a bit brighter so you can see it better yeah i think you can see it better now i hope and i think we are pretty much done um, we might want to change the speed of the sheen maybe using a parameter sheen speed because we might want it to be a bit faster or something so zero four okay so let's use this as a base let's make a material instance out of that so we can tweak all the parameters and then we are pretty much done um yeah i am forgetting naming conventions uh, for this example okay so this is our bottom just want to check if everything works the way it's supposed to so if i change the size the bottom changes accordingly can i change the slant amount yes and everything seems to update accordingly uh, okay so let's just um tweak the um these glow lines here uh i had an intensity i oh, know i had coded this value so these are the glow lines and i give it i give them like a little alpha boost but i want this to be a parameter so i will call these glow lines 
and then CT, which will be two by default, but then I will be able to change it from the material instance. So now I see it here. So you see that if I change it, they get more intense or less intense. And I can tweak maybe the thickness of the line. Raise glow max. And then if I change the wave mean and max size, I can change the fall off of these lines. So for example, if I want them to to um uh, get thinner quicker, I can increase this value. But it is probably too much, but maybe 0 0.9 is nice. 0 0.95. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I liked, uh, I liked it better before. Um, so when we talk about animating this, we could make a, a widget. Um, so I see three animation phases here. One is that we see only the two lines, and then we see only the diagonal lines and then the bottom opens up. So the way we can animate this is we can start with um, mm -mm. we can start with the bottom size. Yeah. So this is what it would look like uh, closed and then it can open up like this. And then let's see what we can do to animate this. So we just want to display the um, the glow lines, which means we might want. Ah, uh, maybe we can change the horizontal fade. Do we have it as a parameter? No. Oh, we have it here. Uh, we can make a parameter out of this. So the moment we multiply this by zero, the fade will be black. So it will mask the entire thing, ex um, excluding the glow lines. So I'm going to make a parameter for this. And I will call it the uh, horizontal fade intensity. It will be two by default. And then we can tweak it. Let's see if it works. And it does. So now we really we have everything that we need to animate this. We can make a widget blueprint. User widget and we'll call this button. And the naming convention is WBP for widget blueprint. Uh, so let's add an image for our button. And our image will be, well, what we used as a preview, so 500 by 80. Uh, and then we assigned the material instance to it. So where did I save it in the demo? There we have our button. So let's make, I will call this image button background. Let's create an animation. Um, so animation, let's call it, let's say button intro. So like the, what the button wish, what it, well, we don't need the word button actually, just intro should be fine. So what the animation that will play when the button appears on screen. So let's choose a track to animate. So in this case, we want to animate the image and specifically we want to animate the material. And specifically we want to animate uh, so what did we say? We want to animate the bottom size X and the horizontal fade intensity. I think those are the two parameters. So this one, the mission is a bit too long for an intro. Okay. Zero, zero five. Why not? Um, so 
Uh, the way I see it, we can split it into three parts. First part, only the glow lines. Second part, uh, only the diagonal lines and the glow lines. And third part, it expands. So that's the way we go about it. So, so for the first part, um, the bottom size will be zero. So this is what we see. And the horizontal fade will be zero. So we see only the lines. And what happens is that in the first part, uh, the horizontal fade becomes one. And this is still zero. And then for this other third, this becomes one. Let's see. It's a bit too fast. Um, maybe we can just make it a little longer. It's an intro, it can be a little longer. So uh, it is 60, so the first 20 and then 40. So bum and then bum. And here we could have, oh, actually no, actually we want to finish like this. And then, at the beginning, we want the glow lines to just appear, to so fade in. So they are one. Zero. And here, ah, the whole opacity, we have, we have a parameter for the fade. Uh, glow lines intensity. Yeah, we can make them disappear completely if we want. So the default value is 2.5. So uh, we want them to become, I want to animate them. So we said that it's a glow lines intensity. So it will become 2.5, but it will start as zero. So first part of the animation, they come in. Second part, the lines come in, third part, the button opens. Uh, horizontal fade intensity, was it one by default? No, two, it's supposed to be two here. Okay, makes more sense. So this is our animation. I think it's not too bad. Button size X is not supposed to be one at the end, but it's supposed to be zero seven. Now it makes more sense. Yeah. Um, so this is how you can then animate it in, um, in UMG. So this is your animation. And then if you want to call this animation from the blueprint, uh, I don't know, when the widget uh, comes uh, on screen, you might want to do it on the construct. You take your friend animation. You do a play animation. I can do this. And you're pretty much done. Then, the, of course, now I don't have this guy playing in the scene. But then what happens is that the animation will play when the widget is constructed. So I think that we had, we are done with the demo. Uh, I had a second demo, but I think uh, we would, I would like to leave more space for the Q&A. Um, so this one was the second idea that I had for the demo, but I think the bottom is definitely something that you would use more often than this specific background pattern. It was just a way to show you how to use the random and the checker mask. But there are so many examples in the Material Lab that you will find something similar to this anyway. Before closing, wrapping up, I'd like just to talk quickly about the next steps that we have for the Material Lab. So of course, now enjoy it, experiment with it, play with it. And what we are planning for the future is of course, more material functions, especially according to your requests. And I will show you just in the next slide um, how you can request new material functions. But then we also wanna have font materials. We want screen space effects because we didn't even talk about those and we didn't talk about vertex offset animations and also via mask and something that would be cool is function cost tags, which are like would be, I don't know, three tiers of 
how expensive this material function is so that people know if they should, if they can spam this like a translate or if they maybe should be a bit more careful. And of course, whenever I talk about performance, always take it with a grain of salt. It really depends on your game and your needs and always profile. But in general, we could have these tags that just give you a ballpark estimation of hey, this material function not to best be messed with too much. Thank you very much. Um, if you want to give some feedback, if you want to request a material function or report something that maybe is not working, you have different ways of doing that. You can uh, leave a comment in the marketplace asset or on the tutorial page, or you can also email me directly. Um, and yes, we are planning for more updates in the future. Uh, I can stop sharing. And I hope this was interesting. I don't know. It was. This was incredible. I I wish yeah. I could get all of the love from chat just into here where you can see it. But everyone is just talking about how amazing of a presentation that was and how much they learned. Yeah. And so thank you so much for that, especially that demo. I think being able to actually walk through it step by step is incredibly helpful for being able to break down kind of demystifying some of those nodes mm -hmm. and how they function and work. So thank you so much for that. That was incredible. I'm glad it was appreciated. I don't know if, uh, Pablo, you wanted to add something um, to to the presentation? Yeah, this is awesome. Thank you very much, Rana. This is great work. And I heard that from our colleagues in, in Slack right now. If we would have this material up at the beginning of our careers, we would it would be much more smoother for us. Yeah. To implement I all think those so UI. Because we're really all pretty much self-taught on materials and we may just make so many mistakes along the road. And if people can just avoid making the same mistakes that we did or just you know kick starting, just getting getting up to speed quicker, that is just that just would be amazing, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I know that UI is, it's kind of a blind spot, especially when it comes, like you were saying, to tutorials or documentation. So mm -hmm. I think really stuff like this, the project, um, the tutorials that go along with the project, as well as even just the stream, are huge strides in being able to kind of catch everybody up past some of those beginner steps so that, you know, People aren't all just starting at the bare minimum and trying to learn from there. And they have a, a kind of a foundation mm -hmm. to work off of. So very much mm -hmm. appreciate you taking the time to actually set all this up. That was my pleasure, really. Um, are there any questions that, that we might uh, help with? There are. There are a few questions that I will toss y'all's way. Um, the first couple ones that I want to go over are a bit more overviewish of not necessarily the Material Labs project itself, but maybe just kind of the concept of UI in general, if you're comfortable with answering some of those. Hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, the first one was uh, they were wondering if you had any advice on if they were a beginner in UI, now that you've provided a project for them to kind of experiment in, what is your advice on them um, from here? What should they do now that they have their hands in this project to continue to learn and push forward in increasing their knowledge? Oh, that's that's a great question. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind, and of course, Pablo, if you, uh, I will also let you answer just just afterwards because I think you might also have a lot great insight on these. But something that I would suggest is just, if you don't have right now a project that you have to work on, because a lot of things you learn them hands-on just by making things, making projects. And if you don't have like right now a game that you're working on, just find some UI that you see on another game and just try to make that. Actually, if I can share my screen real quick, I was doing that just a couple of days ago. I was seeing my partner playing Destiny 2 and i noticed that in your inventory when you have like a new item it has a shine um it has like this sheen that appears and it has this tiny uh very thin frame 
and it is a subtlety but the sheen in the frame is delayed compared to the sheen in the thing and i thought whoa that is time displays i could do that with the time displays so i tried to replicate it and this is my sheen so this will be my mask in the time displays and the value that i'm animating is the translation of the sheen so the sheen moving diagonally and my offset is one in this case so what happens is that the sheen is delayed only on the frame and i just thought that that was such a subtle thing that just gave so much character to it because if i put the offset at zero so i uh, remove the delay everything still looks good but the moment i add the delay it has that something more so something um and i'm done with the screen sharing um so something that i would like to suggest is just find some ui of some game that you like um and just try to replicate that uh, because that will give you a lot of real life <laughs> scenario uh, and you will face challenges um but yeah that is one thing i can think about I don't know if Pablo, you have some other suggestion. I totally agree on that one. Uh, I remember the time when I was trying to uh, remake the Overwatch UI, and at that time I found that it has this very cool uh, tilted. Like it looks like the UI, the parts of the HUD are in the world space distorted, and when I was trying to mimic it, it appeared that they actually just tilted their uh, widgets like that. There is not, not a curve, there is nothing like that. You can just tilt your widgets like seven degree and it looks like it is bent. And that's a great trick. And I realized that only by trying to uh, redo that HUD. Yeah, I agree, I totally agree. That's awesome. I honestly wouldn't have even necessarily thought of that, of just going in and finding UI that you like and trying to recreate it, you know, build it backwards. Yeah. How how was this made? That's a great way to approach that. Yeah, I think so. Awesome. Uh, another question that we've got here is for anyone that's trying to create kind of their own bespoke UI, should they start with some kind of a sketch or some kind of an, an artistic asset to start with as a visual of what they're going for, or just kind of go in and see what happens? Um, what would you think, Pablo? Uh, having a plan definitely would make this faster. Um, so at least to have a wireframe or uh, a mock-up if you have that, or maybe you can uh, find something on the web that you would like to, again, to repeat. But starting out straight from the uh, editor, uh, maybe a bumpy road, uh, only if you are working on the system or something that doesn't really need to be presentational, that may be the way. Uh, however, if you're working on something visual, you should at least know your goal before starting yeah i i agree i think it is necessary at least to have the ux of what you're trying to to do sorted out so you know i don't know if you're making like a whole menu for example it is kind of important that you already know pretty much the layout of it before starting to make the widgets but as far as like the visuals of it um I think sometimes if you don't have already a direction, like you're doing your own project or you have lots of freedom in your project, why don't you start experimenting? Like happy accidents happen and maybe you weren't planning of something looking the way you managed to make it look, but it's better. So I think at, to a certain degree, it's also up to you, up with what you feel comfortable and what your creative workflow is. Absolutely. Uh, get some Bob Ross UI in some of these projects, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, all right, let's see some of the more specific questions that we got in here. Um, have there ever been any situations where you've had to simplify a UI material for performance reasons, or are there any particular nodes that anyone who's a beginner might need to keep an eye out for? Uh, yes. Well, um, so the thing that I find myself the most is uh, simplifying is, um, so one of the most expensive things that you can do in materials is sampling textures in general. Of course, I always talk in general. Um, uh, and in many, many cases, you could replace textures with something else. And so sometimes I work on Fortnite with materials that already exist. And I just want to maybe optimize them. And so I manage, like, instead of having an hexagon texture or hexagon pattern, I can do the math. And I know that that math is cheaper than sampling the texture. Um, so that is something that we do. Um, as for nodes, I actually didn't talk too much. Of, when I was talking about the polar coordinates, I should have mentioned probably that um, the way normally people would go with that is they would involve in their operations the infamous <laughs> 8 and 2, which is the most expensive mathematical, I think the most expensive mathematical operation that you can do in, in, a, in a material. But you don't have to worry about that with our material lab because it uses a cheaper approximation of it, which is, it is a node present in the engine, it's called 8 and 2 faster. Um, and this is an approximation that visually you don't see any difference. So we can totally use that. If you really needed the extra precision, uh, maybe you would want to use the, the original uh, function. But that's something that we keep in mind. In general, um, simpler operations are like add, multiply, min, max, uh, um, I think also frac. Uh, um, the way you measure performance is always relative to everything that is going on. So it's all, you should profile to see if there are some bottlenecks in what you're doing. So if you see that there is a material that seems to be pretty heavy to render or textures that are occupying lots of memory, then maybe that's what you want to focus on. But in general, operations are measured in terms of GPU cycles. So how many cycles it takes to the GPU to complete the operation and definitely it also depends on the GPU because GPU has different architectures. But generally, um, the simpler ones are, as I said, add, multiply, seal, floor, min, max. And then we kind of go more in a bit more complex with smooth step, uh, um, with sine, cosine. Trigonometry is not super cheap. And then when we go in inverse trigonometry, arc tangent, uh, arc sine, arc cosine, then we go even more expensive. But still, I would rec maybe recommend an arc tangent to rather than sampling a texture. Of course, it depends. But, um, but in general, it just depends. Are you, are you on mobile? Like, do you have memory constraints? Then try to free up memory. Um, it, it really depends. But uh, yeah, maybe that's where the function cost tags would come in handy to just have an idea of, hey, this function is expensive. Um, so yeah, depends on the architecture, depends on the context. Um, profile, my answer is profile and you will find out. Awesome. Uh, do you agree with me, Pablo? <laughs> Yes, um, on Fortnite we have a concept of the uh, master material where pretty much everything you have on the screen is combined into a single huge super material and having some for many years and people keep adding to that may make it a beast. So we are trying yeah. to remove the legacy stuff and Irena is actually currently working on one of those. Yeah, uh, the snake. She calls it a snake. <laughs> it is a huge snake of 50 material functions. Um, so yeah, there was a case. That sounds intense. <laughs> <laughs>
because <laughs> sometimes something that performance wise is actually okay is not just it's just not user friendly to use like you just look at it mm. and there is a problem you see the problem and maybe the computer doesn't because the computer doesn't care but there are actual <laughs> human people that have to use these materials you know right <laughs> i also really enjoy the fact that there's the eight and two node that's really expensive and there's literally just one that's called eight and two faster <laughs> yes <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> it is. Oh, another question that we have here is, uh, I feel like kind of similar to what you were doing with the button near the end there uh, when you were animating through the parameters, but how would you handle UI animations that involve multiple stages? Would each animation be made in a separate UI material and then composited via blueprint? And the example that they gave would be like an experience bar that hit a certain threshold and triggered an additional animation. Ah, I see. Um, well, there are cases where you might want to split it into different materials. Um, it also depends on your widget hierarchy, like uh, if it is just better overall for performance to keep a widget uh, collapsed uh, because you probably won't need it very often then it makes sense that that is a separate thing um so there are different degrees of different anim uh, animation phases the one that i showed you with the blueprint and the um, animation sequencer i would say is an intermediate one where you have your phases inside one material but in but animated in sequencer, but you could also go all the way completely in material where you take just one control, which is animation duration. And inside the material, you split it into phases and you use that animation value as a lerp, like as an interpolator to interpolate between states. Actually, I have an example of this. I mean, it's not a, a full example, but in the part three, where we have the material function combinations, uh, which by the way, have all snippets, code snippets. The snippets work only if you have the material because they refer to the material functions that are in the project. Mm. But I am showing something, where is it? Well, let's find it out by scrolling. Uh, so for example, here I am lurping between three different shapes. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm taking time, and I'm using step the gradient. So step the gradient, what it does, it splits uh, the input into discrete chunks. And we tell the step gradient how many chunks we want. So our time goes from zero to one. And let's say we want to split the zero to one into three phases. So we use a step gradient to split it into three uh, chunks. And then we cycle this in, this is um, a lerp between three floats. So yeah, there is no material functions in the previews of the snippets, but basically we have our linear time here plugged to the step the gradient. And this goes as the interpolator in the lerp that lerps between the three different shapes. So this is the most basic one because it just has a harsh transition between the, the stages, but you could have like a small transition between them if you use the remappable gradient. So. Here I'm showing the difference. Uh, yeah, I, it's probably clear here. Maybe I can zoom in a little. Doesn't seem to work much. Ah, it does, okay. Um, so here um, you see that if I use just uh, the linear time, I will not have any, any states. Like the interpolator, we just go from zero to one. It will never stop on a specific uh, shape in the example before it, you just keep uh, transition in between the shapes. This is the example that I showed before with the three different stages, but they can also have like a small gradient between the different stages so that it stops on a stage and then just as a slight transition to the next one. Uh, I don't know if it's very visible, but this third gradient has a transition between, between the different, um, the three different chunks. And this is achieved with the remappable gradient. Because the remappable gradient, is it this one? Yes. 
um, takes actually it's very fast in the engine because without the names um, I'm just gonna borrow the material that I created before uh, it's already here somewhere here so remappable gradient float in this case so I input the gradient mask which could be the linear time if we want to, but just for visualizing, let's use a linear gradient. Uh, so we input this and we will need one, two, three, four values. And I will explain to you why. And I will preview this. The multiply by one is just so that they can preview the node. Uh, so let's just turn everything to default. So, uh, blah 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 and then just want to reset everything so i can show you okay so in photoshop what you would have is you if you wanted to make this gradient here you would need to edit a gradient that starts with uh, black then has a transition between black and this gray and then we have another gray handle here and then the white handle and then the white handle or you can just have black handle gray handle gray handle white handle i hope you're familiar with photoshop otherwise this might make no no sense so let's just make those handles so we need four values as we said black is zero gray uh, we can use zero five and we said gray again, and then we said white. And in terms of positioning, we need these to be at, uh, well, a bit less than a third, and these a bit more than a third, and these a bit less than two thirds, and these a bit more than two thirds. So it will be 0, 32. 0, 033 and then we will have 0, 62, 65 and 0, 66. So this will be post value 1, 2, 3 and 4. And I can show the border so, uh, and I can actually make this gradient more visible. Uh, so I can maybe do 0, 3. And basically, when I change these positions here, I'm just uh, changing as I was as if I was changing in Photoshop where these handles are positioned. So if I make the handles more far apart from each other, I will have a longer transition. So if I accentuate these like 0, 2 and 0, 4, you see how this transition is a lot more. And now you might wonder, but how do you use that in a transition? So let's use a lerp between three shapes. Lerp multiple float. This is a function that is in the engine. And I want to preview this and I want to, to lerp between a circle, a triangle. And now this is where all the tidiness ends and the box. Yes, the box, not just the box. Beautiful. And now I will use my gradient for values here, which right now, of course, says this because we are using the linear again. We want to use the linear time as input. And maybe if I change this, uh, 250 by 250, we keep the ratio. So uh, also I should use the SDFs because they blend a lot better. Um, sorry bum and bum and for the STFs then we need a smooth step as we said before so good let's see zero and zero zero two and the one minus because uh, I want them to be inverted okay so we had the 0204 which has like a longer transition which is the transition you can see between the triangle and the circle so that is like a nice transition 
And then we have like a quicker transition, 0.65 and 0.66 between the other two shapes. Um, so if you, for example, had not the shapes, but something else, like three values that you want to, to change. For example, we wanted our bottom size to be um, zero in the first phase of the animation, uh, zero in the second phase, and 0, 07 in the third phase, we could use these values here instead of these. We just input our phase of 0, 0, and 0, 07. And so these will be our interpolated values. And we will plug this to the bottom size input. And we were basically animating this bottom size as if we had different animation phases. So this is one way of going about it. Um, but then, of course, if you have something more, more complex, it makes sense to split it into different uh, widgets and different materials. Sometimes we have in Fortnite uh, some like super flashy lightning, glow, and sparkles and stuff, and we do separate them. Um, although, yes, the, if you can, like if you find ways not to do that, that's also, that's also fine. Maybe a bit better, but not a big deal. <laughs> I don't know if I answered the question or I went on a tangent. I feel like that appropriately answered the question. And it also okay. taught some extra stuff on the side. So if anything, yeah. it was an even better answer. <laughs> that was incredible. Um, <laughs> again, I kind of wish that you could see the chats because it's just everyone being so impressed of you being able to pull that up and just make it, you know, bum, bum, in 30 bum. seconds. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Here's the full transition, start to finish in a minute. You know, it's fine. No big deal. <laughs> and we used only material function and smooth step. This is true. Um, honestly, this is making me want to go into the engine and just make a bunch of UI for no apparent reason, but just because it looks fun. That's so. good. That's good. <laughs> Um, there's just a couple more questions I want to throw at you. I know we're, we're nearing kind of the end of the time here, so I'm going to try no and make them quick, but, um, there's one question of how many UI master materials are usually needed and, or would you recommend, um, as the maximum for a game? Well, I don't know if I have an answer to that question. Pavlo, do you have an answer to that question? It depends on your UI design and how many screens and UI features you have for it and how complex those are. Um, for example, uh, we have features that use only one master material and we have features that use multiple. Uh, but also we are trying to minimize the amount of master materials because they are hard to handle and support. Um, so yeah, it literally depends on the scale of the UI and amount of the people in the team. If you're alone and you're making it for mobile and you need, uh, I don't know, 300 FPS on your UI, then one master material for the whole UI is a go-to. Um, and the screen yeah, that depends. supports those FPS, though. Yeah, but <laughs> once another person, happens. once another person comes and takes a look at your master material, make sure that uh, that person understands what is going on. Yeah, and I would like to add: if you have one master material, it means you have one asset. But then you might have material functions and stuff. But it means that if someone is using that material, other people cannot use it. So especially if you collaborate, sometimes it might not be a good idea if it's something that many people need to work on at the same time to have this just big giant monster that someone checks out one day and other five people need to use it at the same time. Right. I know that's a... Uh... The idea of, you know, other people might have to come into this file later is <laughs> kind of a good mental note to have for most things. Yeah, it happens in 
all the games that I worked on that a big chunk of what we do is work on stuff that someone else made. This is valid for every discipline almost. It is valid for code. It is valid for UI, for materials. Uh, sometimes like the biggest effort is to really understand first the system that you're working with so that you can make some changes to it. So it is really important that your stuff is understandable. That's why we have best practices. We have naming conventions so that we are all on the same page and at least uh, we have less friction when it, it comes to working with on other people's assets. Yeah, absolutely. Um, only two more. <laughs> We're yeah. almost there. Um, is there any way to create a non-looping animation for materials? Um, I mean, the answer is yes. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by non-looping animation. Like, we do have ways of triggering an animation um, and having it stop. Um, I think it's uh, maybe what they're talking about is if we use the button you created, for example, how mm -hmm. the edges are always shifting back and forth. Would there be a way to create that where it only does it a certain amount of times and then stops? Or would it always just continue to loop? Uh, Yes, definitely there, there is more than one way. Um, the simpler way is that you create your animation in sequencer. So your animation will be like uh, the button that animate for a second or so. But there's also other ways where you can trigger the animation in Blueprint and have the material do all the calculations. Actually, in Fortnite, we have like an experimental sequencer that runs on material um, um i cannot really explain how it works because i would need to open fortnite and you know i can't do it uh, and we don't have this material it's an advanced thing but um if you are a beginner what i suggest is create the animation in sequencer um and um and just play the animation when you have to play it, like on the construct, if it's when your widget is created, um, and it will play once. Um, yeah. If you're interested in that technique, uh, there is a talk by Adriana Pugh, who is also our technical UI design director. You can search for Unreal Fest 2022. And on day one, she was explaining how that works and showing off the blueprints that trigger those animations in materials. Very, very true. Is the advanced templating techniques uh, presentation, Pablo? That's right. Yeah. Awesome. Getting the link for that in the chat right now, because that is also another incredible discussion about UI. So if you want to learn any more about it, please do go check out that talk by Adrian. It's incredible. Um, so yes, please check that out as well. All right, the last question I have for y'all today. Um, what are, in your opinion, the most useful learning sources for SDFs or UF, UV math or just kind of getting into this in general? Um, so, um, something that I find really, really useful but you need to understand coding because it, it is done in HLSL, um, no, in GLSL, uh, which is very similar to HLSL, which is the language that we use in, in Unreal Engine, is the Book of Shaders, which is a website. Uh, so no, it says book, but it's a website. Um, and um, it, has, it has the basics. The example in this case will not use Unreal Engine materials, but they will use code. But the functions are the same. The mathematical operations are the same. You have frac, you have um, uh, add, multiply, all, all, everything is there pretty much. There are some subtle differences when you have to convert from one language to another, but they are the same things. Um, in, if it's specifically to SDFs, um, in the material lab, uh, inside the material functions for the SDFs, there is a link that is learn more about SDFs with Inigo Kielitz. 
who is the god of, of SDFs. Like he's very famous in the shader enthusiast community because he he provides these functions and it explains them and it shows examples. So there is additional learning material inside the, the example materials and the functions in the material lab. Uh, and I can post some stuff additionally in the tutorials. So I will just make a note that I will do that. Uh, or just make it more work for you. That's all. <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, then I will see if I can nab some of those links real quick to toss them up in chat. I know Book of Shaders is in there now, and I'll see if I can grab some of those other ones. But um, that's it for the questions today. So before we wrap up, are there any kind of last words? Oh, that sounds ominous. Any final thoughts? <laughs> Let me put it that way. <laughs> any final thoughts for everyone watching? Um, I was very excited to present these. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or any feedback or any request. We are more than happy to just provide more stuff for you. And I also want to point out that this work is not only my work, it is a collaborative work. And there are also like uh, other colleagues in the Fortnite UX UI team that have contributed to some of these functions and they are also credited in the functions. So huge thanks to everyone i'm i'm really happy that we came to this day and that i was able to show it uh, uh, thank you a lot F pablo for being here um uh, it was it was really important to me that, that 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 you were here and thanks a lot to adrian pew because she provided lots of support uh, for the material lab to matthew wadstein because he helped uh, with getting it um, uh, to the marketplace uh, to you and then for the coordinating the live stream of course Utina, I meant, uh, and then, um, and uh, the entire Fortnite UX UI team. Absolutely. And thank you both for taking the time to be here today. I know you're not unbusy people, <laughs> so I appreciate you being here and taking the time to sit down with us and walk through the project and really give everyone an in-depth look at how this works and how they can utilize it and what these nodes are, where they can find them. So thank you so much for taking the time to do that. I really appreciate it. It was a pleasure. Awesome. And then last but certainly not least, thank you everyone who came and watched the show today. If you missed any part of the stream, no worries. We post everything in video format that can be viewed on demand on both our Twitch and YouTube channels at Unreal Engine. You can also follow us on all social media, Unreal Engine, as well as please come say hi in the forums where you can get all the latest news, as well as find other like minded individuals and developers who can help you along your development journey, answer any questions, or you might be able to help someone else as well. So come join us there as well. And with that, one last big thank you for everyone who came and we'll see y'all tomorrow. We have another episode of LFG tomorrow. We'll have on some of the uh, developers who created the award-winning VR game Moss 2. So make sure you come check that out and yeah, we'll see y'all later. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.